Gospel lessons found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side, So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return... I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. That's the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. And let's start today uh, with our prayer challenge prayer. So if you know that, at home, you can say it out loud and hear with me if you want to say it, you can, um, or just quietly as I pray it. Lord Jesus, I love you with my whole heart, mind, soul, and strength, and I want to love my neighbor as myself. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your love. I surrender to your will. I surrender to the transformations your love will make inside of me. Use me to love well. Amen. Um, So we're continuing our summer series, Love Well in a Divided World. And this week what we're talking about is how do I love my neighbor well? And before we can really move into that, I want to remind you what we mean by loving well. Uh, By love, what we mean is to love with agape. To love with the powerful love of God that God puts inside of us because of Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Not just love that we muster up from ourselves, but God's agape, actual, his actual essence and presence, his love out from us. That's what we mean by loving well. It's a powerful, powerful love. It's the most powerful love. And so... We need to talk about neighbor then in terms of what the Bible says about neighbor. So what does the Bible mean by neighbor? Um, In Hebrew, the word for neighbor is rea. And rea implies an emotional nearness. So the word rea is used for brother, companion, lover, husband, and neighbor throughout the Old Testament. It is an emotional nearness. It is a relationship word. It is a relationship nearness word, okay? I want you to think about the nearness part of this. Nearness is really important. And then in the New Testament, the word they have, the Greeks don't really have a word that comes close to rea. They have plesion, and plesion actually just means near or close by. So, it's, I think, a Sesame Street. Remember Sesame Street when they would, do, I always want to run to the camera to do this. But they go near, and they get really close, and far, right? That's plesion. Is, plesion is close in proximity. And what Jesus does, especially in the parable that we have today, and in how he taught his disciples to love their neighbors well, he connects the two. He connects Rhea and plesion. He does something Uh, new and extra with both of those words. And so if we're going to talk about how Jesus wants us to love our neighbors well, let's start actually with our psalm, okay? Because something, the psalmist, 
does something really cool here that I think is uh, pivotal and, and so important to loving our neighbors well. Psalm 101, verse 1, the psalmist says, I will sing of your love and justice to you, Lord, I will sing praise. What does that sound like? It sounds like worship. It's worship. It's drawing near to God. God needs to be our first rea. He needs to be our first neighbor, our first near relationship. And when we draw near to God, James says, when draw near to God and God will not draw near to you. God's already near to us. When we worship, we can expect to experience the nearness of God. That's why we should be worshiping all the time. And so he says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. In other words, I, my, I want my whole life to be spiritual worship. And then he says, when will you come to me? When? When? And I love that he says when and not will you come to me or if you come to me. He expects that as he draws near to God, God will draw near to him and he will experience the nearness of God. I love this. And it's it, throughout that psalm, he makes it very clear that his desire is to stay near to God and not be distracted by other things. And so I'll just jump to verse five. The rest, you know, three, four, and five uh, in, include this. But for example, whoever slanders their neighbor in secret, I will put to silence. There's a, you know, a couple ways you can do this. What happens when you confront people who are gossiping? You can either say, you shouldn't gossip, or you just don't be part of it, right? Slandering your neighbor, and I'm not going to have part of it. I'm not going to be distracted by this. He says, uh, whoever has haughty eyes and a proud heart, I will not tolerate. I'm not going to be part of it. I'm not going to let that, the worldly stuff, Come between me and my rea, my nearness with God. I want God near so I can love well. He says, my eyes will be on the faithful in the land. That they may dwell with me. You want to surround yourself with other people who are seeking God and God's nearness, his rea. And the one who, whose walk is blameless will minister to me. And there's two parts to that, really, for Christians especially. The one whose walk is near to uh, the one whose walk is blameless will minister to me. If we're walking with other people who are seeking God, who, who want him to be their best and first and foremost neighbor in love, that's going to minister to you. But whose walk is blameless? Jesus. Jesus, right? And so we seek the one whose walk is blameless and he ministers to us and keep that in mind as we go into the parable because we all needed to be ministered to by the one whose walk was blameless. And uh, we're going to think about that on Sunday as well. But uh, Jesus is the only one whose walk is blameless and he is who we need so we can love our neighbors well. We're going to move into the gospel now, um, and I had about 37 pages of notes that I narrowed down to four. Um, so we're going to, I'm going to talk more on Wednesday about the depth, some, like a deep dive into this parable. Um, so please watch the Wednesday Bible study. I think you're really going to enjoy that, and I, I have to sum some of this up today. But what I would love for you to do today from not now but after is to read Luke 9 and 10 together please read Luke 9 and 10 all together because they go together you don't want to separate them and and it'll all help make what I say today make even more sense if you read Luke 9 and 10 together um, but we're gonna we're gonna start with uh, Luke 10 1 to 21 because this is Jesus plan for his disciples, the 12 plus the 72, these other followers of Jesus, disciples of Jesus, not the 12, but 72, this is his plan to love their neighbors well. And so these are people who are, have drawn near 
to Jesus. They've walked with Jesus. They've sat at the feet of Jesus. They've had Jesus pouring into them. And now he sends them out. And this is a really beautiful thing. So after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was, uh, was about to go. This is so critical, right? Where did he send them? He sent them to a place where he was about to go. Think of the nearness of that, okay? Um, He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Who does the field belong to? Belongs to God. The, the The world doesn't belong to Satan. The world doesn't belong to us. The world belongs to God. And he sends us into his harvest field so that he can draw near, that he can be Rhea with us, that that he can be close to us. Uh, He says, go, I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. In other words, don't be distracted. What did the Psalm say? I'm not going to be distracted. I want to love you first. I want you to be my my first Rhea. I want to do your will, your way. His ways are higher than our ways. He says, uh, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. That's the one that Jesus is the Prince of Peace. It's what he can give. Peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. You don't lose anything by listening to God and following his will to go and offer peace to somebody. If they don't want it, it, don't worry. There's more of it and what you offer will return to you. That's what Jesus says. Okay? Um, your peace will, now, if someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Don't be distracted. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick who are there. Tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. So this is the instructions for how the followers of Jesus can be neighbor, Rhea, Planeas, to people that God loves, moved by his Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit leads you to a neighbor and you bless them and offer them peace and blessing that only Jesus can give, that only the Holy Spirit can give, the, the nearness of Jesus is going to follow. He sends you ahead of him. He is going to go there after you. They will experience Jesus because of you. Um, now, I have to say this. This is such a big deal about what, because of what's going on in the world today. There's so many movements going on in the world today. And truthfully, we've known for 20 years now that Generation Xers and iGens, uh, you know, the, the internet generation, the in, intellectual property generation, Gen Zs, their big focus is I want to save the world. I want to save the planet. This movement, all these movements, okay? To do what? To save the world, okay? We don't save the world, people. It's God's world. He'll save it. How about if at least Christians, if we Christians filled with the Holy Spirit can just go to one person at a time that the Holy Spirit draws us to That we're moved in the spirit, that we pour oil and wine, blessing of peace, blessings and peace on these people so that Jesus can follow because Jesus saves them. And that multiplies. You want to be part of a movement? Be part of the movement of the Holy Spirit. I think anybody who read Acts 2 would love it if the world ended up looking like that. And that's where we do it. That's how we do it. By the power of the Holy Spirit. One person at a time. Just be a neighbor. The way that Jesus says be a neighbor. Love that one person or that one family well by being near to them with the love of God and the Holy Spirit. And Jesus will do the saving. All right. Verse 10, Jesus says, But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets, say, even the dust of your town, we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near. Do you think that every time you go to somebody the Holy Spirit sends you to, that they're going to be automatically open and receptive? No, you'll probably be rejected a whole bunch of times. But what this says is, you know what? It doesn't matter. Whatever you pour out, you're not going to lose. Not only that, 
God is near. And if God is near, stuff will happen. You may never even see it. But God is near. The fact is that God is near. And so if you try to love your neighbor and they don't want your love or God's love, it doesn't change the fact that God is near. And if God is near, kingdom stuff is going to happen. Okay? We need to trust that. And what happens then, even if we are rejected, what Jesus says, what, what actually happened here when Jesus sent out the 72, is they all came back, verse 17 says, they all came back filled with joy. And you got to believe that some of them were rejected. Some of them had to shake the dust off their feet and do what Jesus said. But they were all, all of them were filled with joy. They returned filled with joy. When we do what God sends us to do and we draw near to people and the Holy Spirit moves in us, that fills us with joy. And guess what happens then, which is really exciting to me, if Jesus is your first love, verse 21 says, when they returned filled with joy, Jesus was filled with joy through the Holy Spirit. So if you want to make Jesus filled with joy through the Holy Spirit, do what he tells you to do. One person at a time. Experience God moving through you. That makes Jesus filled with joy. And then he's all celebrating because the secrets of, of the heavenly, heavenlies are becoming uh, uh, revealed for the people who follow him. It's, it's this chain reaction effect of, of serving God that way in trust and in love. It's really exciting. So all of this, all of this stuff that he tells his disciples to do is connected to what we heard in the gospel today. It's all connected. Remember, 9 and 10 are connected. And so this guy, this teacher of the law, remember, in Greek, it's namas. It means law. In Hebrew, it's Torah. And Torah is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. This is the story of God's relationship with us and how we stay in relationship with God and with one another. The Torah is about Rhea. It's about nearness. And so this guy is a teacher of the law, and he, he's testing Jesus, and, and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? That is a nearness question. What must I do to inherit eternal life? How can I be near God and others forever? That's a nearness question. Jesus asks him, what does the Torah say about it? How do you read it? And he answered, he answers this from Deuteronomy chapter 6, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself Jesus says, you have answered correctly, do this. He's also quoting from Deuteronomy 6, uh, chap, uh, verse 2, do this and you will live. So they're having a real Bible study thing going on here. And this is all about relationship. Now the guy hears from the Spirit, and what happens when the flesh hears from the Spirit? The flesh pushes back against the Spirit and what does he do? He tries to justify himself. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who's my neighbor? All right, I'm going to find a loophole. People, don't we love to find loopholes and make excuses and find a way out? That's what the flesh does. But there's no love in that. There's no joy in that. We surrender and we find the joy, okay? So the spirit wants us to be near other people. The flesh wants us to be away from other people. The parable is going to answer both of these questions. What must I do to inherit eternal life? And who is my neighbor? And it's, a, it's an image of what was happening with the 72. Okay? So the, the, there's a guy. Jesus says there's this guy who's going from Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a very dangerous road. And I'll tell you again, I'm going to do a deep dive into this on Wednesday. You got to want to see what happens Wednesday. But this guy gets uh, attacked by robbers. He's robbed, has his clothes stolen. He's beaten. He's left for dead. So he's shamed, beaten, bloody, half dead, left for dead. I want to just pause for a second and have you consider that this is the condition that God sees us in when we are far from God. I, I hope that makes sense to you. 
the condition that we're in, that God sees us in and is moved to compassion to send his one and only son for us, to save us, is because we were beaten by Satan, we were bloodied and left for dead because of sin. Our condition is only one that Jesus Christ can solve. And he, he is moved to, do, to draw near to us and do something about that. The best way we can love our neighbor is to bring Christ near. It's to bring Christ near. So there's a Levite who knows the law inside and out, and there's a priest, and they don't help the guy. In fact, they, they cross the street to get away from him. And I just want to point out, again, people, don't think that the most likely person to draw near to somebody who needs the Lord is the one who's going to do it. Don't expect the religious leaders, don't expect the pastors or the priests, don't expect the, the saints, the saintly looking people to be the ones who are actually going to be moved by the Spirit and obey the Lord. If you're moved and the Holy Spirit's moving you, don't leave it up to somebody else. You do it. You do it. So the Samaritan is the least likely person to help who we assume is a Jew going from Jerusalem to Jericho. He's the least likely person, but he is moved. Verse 33, a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. This is a really hard to say Greek word. It's oh, splagnizomai. And it kind of means what it sounds like. It means that you're moved in your guts. Splagnizomai, it's, it's another word for compassion. It's like emotional heartburn. You're moved in your guts. And so he sees the man in the condition that he's in, and he just, he's a, he knows God. They worship on the mountain. He loved God. The same God, Yahweh. And he's moved in his guts over this person and he draws near to him. Verse 34, he went to him. He bandaged his wounds, wounds pouring on oil and wine, which by the way is blessing and peace. I'm, I got to nutshell some of these symbols here. It's blessing and peace, just like the 72. Then he put, on the man his, put the man on his own donkey. Oh man, I got to talk about that Wednesday. Brought him to an inn and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, gave it to the innkeeper, look after him. He said, when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. And I've got to nutshell that symbolism too, that God is the innkeeper and the kingdom of God is the inn. And because he drew near to him and poured peace and blessing upon him and took him to the presence of God, God took care of him. There was a relationship between the, man, the, the wounded man and the Samaritan and the innkeeper that was going to last. Okay? The Samaritan loved well because he came near, and by coming near, the dying man was saved, brought into the presence of God, and the nearness remained between them and God. Okay? That's Ten Commandments stuff. That is Ten Commandments. That's what Paul's talking about in Romans that we read when he says, when you, when you do this, when you obey the law, when you, that's, you're loving. The Ten Commandments is all about rea. It's all about being near in relationship with God and with one another. How do we love our... Okay, so Jesus says, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers, the expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. I'm going to unpack mercy on Wednesday. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. How do we love our neighbor? Well, we, we go and do likewise. We go and do like, we, we do like Jesus. We draw near to Jesus like the psalm said, we draw near, we worship, we love the Lord. He draws near to us. 
We love him with our, all our hearts, mind, soul, and strength. When we look and we see the condition that our neighbors are in, we have to see them like God sees, we have to see the world like God sees the world. And if we see the world as people who've been robbed and beaten and shamed and bloodied and left for eternal death, then hopefully the Holy Spirit is going to move us in compassion, move our guts to draw near to these people who desperately need the salvation that only Jesus can bring. Then we look, we see the nation, the, the condition our neighbor's in, we go near we pour on the blessing and peace, the oil and the wine of Jesus Christ over them and some of them will receive it. Jesus will follow and if they open up their hearts to him, they will have life in Jesus' name. And, then, and they'll have life with us in Jesus' name. The kingdom of God has come near. God is near. When we love our neighbors well, with God's agape love, we help to open them up to the nearness of Jesus Christ and he saves them and he gives them life in a never-ending, unbreakable rea, nearness with him. This is, what he, this is what happens when we love our neighbors well. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I just thank you that you task us with this wonderful task of being able to first draw near to you, see the world like you see the world. Your Holy Spirit moves us to one person or one family where we can pour out your love, your peace, your blessing, your oil, your wine, and give them the opportunity to open themselves to you, to receive you, to be carried by you, to be loved by you, and receive newness of life forever. Thank you that we get to be part of that. That fills us with joy, and that fills you with joy. Oh, Lord, let us fill you with joy. In Jesus' name, amen.